when I first looked at this gospel, all I could think of was going to the mall at different times. I haven't been there in a long, long time. Certainly don't approach them near the Christmas season, or during Advent, I should say. <clears throat> in thinking of the days when malls were filled with young people, just hanging around and seemingly aimless, not knowing what to do, or maybe, I should say, trying to decide what to do. <clears throat> and they would be sitting around the fountains or in the places where other people might have been resting or taken a moment to rest. But nevertheless, it was a marketplace that was filled with young people. And so when I read this, what, to what shall I compare this generation? They are like children. <clears throat> That's what I thought of. But in reading over and looking at um, different references about the gospel, I realized it means something entirely different naturally. There were no malls in Jesus' days, but there were many marketplaces. And just as young people do today, and I might add that older people use malls now for exercise, which is not a bad thing. Um, young people used to hang around the marketplaces, maybe to try to sne um, sneak a snack, a piece of fruit. But in Jesus' day, the boys and the girls used to make believe, just like our young people still do today. And what did they make believe? They made believe that they were at weddings or at funerals. Now, I know that some of us who were later on ordained, whether at, an, at a younger time or delayed as I was, as children made believe we were celebrating mass. We would make little round circles of wonder bread nice white sliced bread, smatten it, smash it together, and make hosts. Some of us celebrated funerals for our goldfish and our peewee turtles. I won't mention how many funerals that I, I put together, but my sister and my cousins obviously were all part of the, the cortege. And so the young people in Jesus' day did similar things. They, because they wanted to entertain each other and themselves, the young boys oftentimes would make, make believe that they were at weddings, and so they played flout, flutes, and no one danced because they wanted to do something else. They hadn't decided yet what they were going to play. The girls often, unfortunately, sang dirges because they imitated a funeral, but no one mourned because they didn't know what they wanted to do. And so Jesus starts speaking about this, kind of like how young children are today, how adults are today. We have so many things to entertain us that we're not sure what we want to do. We're not sure what we want to use for entertainment. And so Jesus is saying, you can't win no matter what you do, basically. And so he goes on to say, and we know that he's criticizing the people who have been criticizing them, he and John he goes on to criticize them because they're complaining about what John did and does and what Jesus did and does. Basically, John, we know, went out into the desert. He fed himself on locusts and wild honey. When I was in Israel, I learned that locusts are also berries. They're very hard berries and they're very bitter but they seem a little more palatable than something that looks like a grasshopper, I think. And so he ate locusts mixed with honey. He went into the desert. He fasted, and he convinced his disciples naturally to fast because of what their message was. They were preparing for the kingdom that was to come. And so the fasting helped them be prepared for the coming of the king. And we know that John was the one who pointed out the Lord to his disciples and to us. John is such an important figure during the season of Advent. And so they criticized him because he seemed demented, strange. He lived in the desert. He ate strange things. He acted strangely wearing camel hair. Jesus came along, and he was the opposite. He feasted with people. He went into their homes. He brought them to the Lord by being with them, by befriending them, by helping them understand. 
and he was criticized. But the last line gives us the key. Wisdom shall be vindicated by her works. And so by what John did, the people were convinced to be baptized. They were convinced to follow Jesus because he pointed who Jesus was. Because Jesus went with the people, they were convinced that God was their friend, that God loved them, that God wanted to be close to them because Jesus brought them that message. And so their works, just like our works, just like the works of the saints, is what draws others to God. We have perfect examples in Rome, the holy city. Because throughout the ages, popes have done wonderful things, and they've also been criticized by what they do, it's often by what they say. Pope Benedict was a wonderful man, but he was criticized by many because he was too traditional and too conservative. Many grasped onto what he preached by what he did because they were drawn to that. On the other hand, Pope Francis is more liberal. He goes out and he touches people. He's with the people. He often says things off the cuff, which distresses many. But how many people are brought to the Lord by these holy men? By John Paul, St. John Paul II, by Pope Benedict, by Pope Francis, by us? That is the message of the gospel. Will our works be worthy of wisdom? Will they be worthy of the Lord? Will they be worthy of heaven?